Yes, the money changers have fled from their high seats in the temple of our civilization. We may now restore that temple to the ancient truth. The measure of that restoration lies in the extent to which we apply social values, far noble than mere monetary profit. For in your time, we have the opportunity to move not only towards the rich society and the powerful society, but upward to the great society. So what does that mean? Well, it starts by making sure that everyone in America gets a fair shot at success. In the classrooms of America, there your children's lives will be shaped. We have the power to shape the civilization that we want. Everyone gets a fair shot. When everyone does their fair share. Our destiny in the 1990s and beyond is far different from the one with which our predecessors and their rendezvous 50 years ago. We have a higher calling than greed and bravado. We got organized as a country and we wrote a fairly radical constitution with a radical bill of rights, giving a radical amount of individual freedom to America. It was assumed that the Americans who had that freedom would use it responsibly. Personal freedom is being abused, you have to move to limit it. The Supreme Court never ventured into the issues of redistribution of wealth and sort of more basic issues of political and uh, economic justice in the society. This nation is asking for action and action now. It wasn't that radical. It, it didn't break free from the essential constraints that were placed by the founding fathers in the Constitution. It can be accomplished in part by direct recruiting by the government itself. Restore fairness. Fair and open and honest. By engaging on a national scale in a redistribution. Everyone engages in fair play and everybody gets a fair shot and everybody does their fair share by national planning. That is the height of unfairness. Fair play, a fair shot, and a fair share, a fair chance. We are, I know, ready and willing to submit our lives and our property to such discipline because it makes possible a leadership which aims at the larger good. Progressivism is a cancer in this nation. Progressivism represents everything that is hostile to American greatness, American individualism, and everything that has given us the future. It is a cancer that has literally eaten away and destroyed the very foundations of America that puts government ahead of the private sector, that puts collectivism ahead of the individual. You've had progressives who have contributed to this over many decades. One of the quirky things is that the word progressive, the left just simply uses as the sort of anti-fascist word. They use it as the word that just means good things. Ooh, it's progressive coffee, it must be good coffee. Ooh, it's a progressive rock band, I guess you gotta listen to the words, right? This is one of the great myths of the 20th century, that fascism was a phenomenon of the right. It came out of the left, its leaders were of the left, just like Bolshevism was, or progressivism was, and all the rest. It helps you understand the 20th century more. The non-conservatives are constantly arguing about equality, equality. You want absolute equality of outcomes, you can look at North Korea. North Korea is your perfect egalitarian society. The problem is people are starving to death. The problem is it's a police state. To pound down the free enterprise system and simply say that we should steal from the rich to make the middle class uh, richer, that has never worked anywhere. If you want complete equality in income, then go to Cambodia. Everybody's poor. Our job is to take all of the arguments they're making and say no. That's not what America is all about. Those things are actually destroying the very foundations of this country. Political philosophy, progressivism in America was expressly intended to wring out individuality, of it, to wring out the sense of the sovereignty of the individual. It became obvious to me that what was key in our society was individual sovereignty. 
the initial uh, premise that I make about human beings. That is, I assume that I, Walter Williams, belong to myself and you belong to yourself. That is, I am my private property and you are your private property. The individual sovereignty is as old as man himself. But for so much of mankind's history, it wasn't respected, it wasn't appreciated. That the greatness of each individual free to do what he or she wants to do economically, socially, politically, culturally. Every single one of us has God-given rights, unalienable rights, that no power can take, that no power that can give other than God himself. Look, the founding fathers realized that the beauty of America was in the individual, not in the state. We had a revolution based on this concept. We have a constitutional form of government that limits the powers of our government so that we don't see uh, huge expansions of, uh, of government power into our individual life. And that's what makes our country so different. We have allowed the individual free reign to be whatever he or she wants to be, needs to be, desires to be. And because we have allowed that, we have been the greatest nation on the face of the earth in terms of wealth, in terms of prosperity, innovation, risk-taking, entrepreneurship. We conservatives, this is what we defend. We defend the nature of the individual, the nature of man, and individual sovereignty. Because the more people dependent on government, fewer people who are actually free. And for that very reason, we had to keep it as small as possible. The larger the role of public sector and the government in our lives, the less control we have. The government that governs best governs least. The larger the government, the smaller the citizen. The founders of our country recognized that government was a necessary evil. So the Constitution is crucial, which is exactly why the left, the utopians, the statists, reject the Constitution. They fight the Constitution. They dismiss the Constitution. I love my country. I love our society. But what I revere is my Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Our Declaration and Constitution are key to the survivability of this nation. The legitimate role of government in a free society is to stop one person from violating the property rights of another person. The purpose of our Constitution is not to grow a centralized, uh, all-powerful, concentrated federal government. It means protection of private property rights. What's mine is mine is what yours is yours. It means that we have a system of free trade. It means that we believe in the rule of law, that we, that we don't just make up the rules as we go along. When government goes beyond that, then it is a force for evil and oppression. Conservatism has always been skeptical of state power. It's always wanted to push political decisions to the lowest level possible, let people run their own lives. And it has always been the left that has always wanted to increase state power to control people's lives. What the founders were trying to do is preserve the civil society and at the same time create a functioning government. Government exists to undergird, to nurture the civil society, not to attack it and not to devour it. And when the civil society is being devoured and attacked, that means the individual is being devoured and attacked. We have long recognized and believed that civic society is the most vibrant, most important part of our community. It fuels this notion of independence, this American sense of self-sufficiency that is largely unprecedented in the world. Have you noticed how the left speaks? They talk about the masses, they talk about the workers. Do you notice conservatives don't talk that way? We talk about individuals. We talk about families. And it, it's no coincidence that we see in much of American pop culture a demonization of the nuclear family and traditional family values. The idea that uh, voluntary associations between men and women and the propagation of families and communities as the nucleus of American society poses a threat to their top-down nanny state. Well, one of the policies of government that has been very devastating to uh, black people in general has been the whole welfare state. The welfare state has done to black Americans what slavery could not have done, what the harshest Jim Crow laws could not have done, and the rankest racism could not have done, namely, destroy the black family. 
If I were the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, I could not find a more effective means to sabotage black academic excellence than the public school system in most of our cities. It doesn't have anything to do with discrimination. It has to do with the, with the welfare state. That is unprecedented in black history. You have a president of the United States that talks about redistributing wealth. On what constitutional basis can he do those things? None. So what's happening now, he and many others are trying to impose on this nation an alien system of government that will devour the private sector, that will devour the civil society, and ultimately devour the individual. We need to put that process into reverse. If you look at the great tragedies throughout mankind's history, it's been caused by government. One of the things necessary to regain our liberty in our country is to recognize that the government is not a force for good. The government is a is a force for evil. And for that very reason, we had to keep it as small as possible. The United States was built on the freedom of the individual, constitutionally limited government, fiscal responsibility, and yes, free markets. Capitalism is the greatest collective enterprise in the history of humanity the most successful cooperative endeavor ever conceived of by humanity. It's just got one flaw. It doesn't feel like it. Free markets. It is the only system that creates wealth for the most people. No other system can, no other system will. And the reason is it goes hand in hand with individual sovereignty. Well, I, I think that the free market is morally superior because they acknowledge private property that is peaceable voluntary exchange. The fundamental principle around which the American society and the American economy are organized. Private property that cannot be confiscated by the government. There's this huge connection between economic freedom and political freedom. Before the Bolshevik Revolution, or even in Nazi Germany, the first thing that was done was to go after the small businessman because he's independent. One of the cancer cells of the American economy, the reason that we're not growing, the reason that we're not creating jobs, the reason that so many young people can't find a career is because the government is crowding out the private enterprise system, which Barack Obama hates. He's He loathes the free enterprise system. Barack Obama hates businesses. He's never worked for a business. He's never started a business. He doesn't understand business when he doesn't know how the job creation process works. Free market capitalism is, in fact, the cornerstone of freedom in American entrepreneurship. It's all about empowering the individual so that he can do his own thing with government out of the way. One of the major reasons for the government intervention is the work done by John Maynard Keynes, is to increase the power of the central government and engage in a lot of spending. The uh, intervention of government into our economy to try to save us is a big mistake. The free market system is the goose that lays the golden eggs. It's the reason why America is rich and so many other countries are poor. And what is so troubling is to see Barack Obama treating our entrepreneurs and our small businessmen and women like ATM machines that they can just raid for cash to fund all these stupid government programs. When the government intervened during the 1930s, it turned what would have been a very sharp two or three year economic downturn into a 10 or 12 year affair. The same thing is happening today. As government grows, as government gets bigger and bigger, people become less and less free. Barack Obama has borrowed more money in four years than the United States government borrowed to finance the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, the Great Depression, the war against communism. I mean, we are on a very reckless pace right now. And the real problem for young people, if you're under the age of 30, you're the victims of these policies. I call this the greatest episode of fiscal child abuse in American history. This is the road to ruin. One of the most subversive ideas of this administration is the idea that the middle class can't get ahead. The whole American dream has been based on the idea that if you do work hard, if you play by the rules, if you save and invest and take risks, that's how you get ahead. 
that's what the founding fathers intended for this country. That's why they enshrined private property as such a central part of our freedoms. The left, they're making the moral case for socialism. They're making the moral case for redistributionism in buzzwords like economic justice, social justice. We need to make the moral case for free market capitalism. That's the major contribution of Friedrich Hayek and also von Mises uh, in human action. Points out that it's human action, peaceful voluntary exchange that we should uh, encourage. Barack Obama puts fairness and equality ahead of growth and prosperity and making everyone better off. That the best way to lift up the poor is to create a robust economy with growth and jobs and businesses that are doing well. Because the free market is the only thing that allows the individual to be who he or she is meant to be. It unleashes your spirit. It allows you to go out and innovate and create and be the person who you were set to be by the Almighty. It allows you to pursue your dreams. It allows you to pursue your goals. People who embrace empty slogans like people over profits and talk about caring over corporations completely miss, of course, is that it is the American individual entrepreneur, those free market job creators and wealth creators who give us the future that we have are the bedrock of economic success in this country. And I think that's a key distinction that we often overlook. There's a huge difference between being pro-business and pro-free market. And principled conservatives are pro-free market. Never before in human existence had such a confluence of events occurred and created such a magnificent country. No other nation on the face of the earth had ever constructed itself on those ideas. That's the basis of American exceptionalism. That core idea of individual liberty. The shining city on the hill. The idea that there's something very special about this country. Very unique. Nobody talks about the French dream or the Swedish dream. Nobody talks about people who've risked their lives and, and crawled over broken glass to get across the borders and come into this country and start with nothing. The founders understood the fragility of free market economics and individual liberty. They understood the temptations of a growing state, telling us about the hard work of liberty that it's going to take to preserve American exceptionalism. You know what American exceptionalism has given us? It's given us over 250 years, the greatest superpower on the face of the earth, the most prosperous economy, and the most creative, innovative, and yes, free people on the face of the earth. This is what Ronald Reagan meant by shining city on a hill, that it was divine inspiration that put this country here as a beacon of freedom and free enterprise. It takes courage to be a conservative. You want a little, little secret? It doesn't even take that much courage to be a conservative in these surroundings because you have all the ideas on your side. You're standing athwart the tide on these campuses that says you're all individuals as long as you agree completely with your wacko left-wing professors. And instead, you're saying, hey, no, look, there's this body of, of thought where really smart people have been working on certain ideas and certain principles and certain moral precepts for thousands of years, and maybe they have something to offer. I can remember when I was a teenager and history teachers were, you know, trying to pass off history in sort of a propaganda way, and I just knew intuitively, instinctively, I love my country, this can't be right. And it was this constant tear down, tear down, tear down. So I resisted that. And then uh, when I went into college, I was surrounded by leftists everywhere you go. And I mean leftists, Marxists, socialists, all kinds of names I never even heard of before. And they're going on and on about what a hateful country this is and what a terrible country it is while they're wolfing down chocolate chip cookies in the cafeteria. Uh, and I thought to myself, there's something wrong with this picture too. Maybe the latest theory from the gender studies department isn't all that interesting. Maybe these guys in the faculty lounge have been looking through the wrong end of the telescope. And the wisdom of the ancients has something to offer us. We work on the assumption that there were smarter people who came before us and who thought seriously about things, that we are standing on the shoulders of those giants. So I would do my own reading, my own studying, not what was hand-fed to me by the professors and, uh, and others. 
and it became obvious to me. Everything I was hearing was wrong, dead wrong. Conservatism stands athwart all of that. Conservatism says, no, the individual is sovereign. It says the individual, the individual conscience, which has to be properly formed, is superior to these things and that, that we stand against the tide of, this, of progressivism in American life, of liberalism. And nowhere does that, that effort matter more than on American college campuses. In part, simply because it's the one place where you can really have the argument in full. It's the one place where you can really sort of explore it and have a good time in the process. If you are politically conservative uh, or you desire to be understand uh, conservative ideas, you basically have to swim upstream. And that means that you have to be willing to step out and be independent and often uh, face ridicule. You know, you showed up at a dinner party and you're wearing jeans rather than a tuxedo. It is the challenge of your generation to make sure that the United States continues to be the world leader in innovation, in prosperity. We've got to get young people energized. We need to get young people coming to Washington with pitchforks and saying, hell no. You guys are the future of America. You shouldn't let it get you down that your numbers are small. Of course they're going to be small. They have to be small. I took law school not as an opportunity for me to be indoctrinated, but as an opportunity for me to spread the word to people who never heard it before. A couple of them were actually curious about what I was saying. As a conservative in academia, you're always going to be in the minority. As a matter of fact, you're always going to be in a very, very small minority. That's why you're going to be smarter and more thoughtful and, in fact, more aggressive than all the students around you. They're part of the crowd. They're part of the group. It doesn't take courage to be a leftist. They want to feel like they belong to a team or a club or that politics is all about filling the holes in our souls to make us feel like we're making the best yearbook ever, right? They, that's what they want from politics. You're always going to be outnumbered by these people because they're always going to misunderstand the role of government and the role of politics. And so it's okay to be outnumbered. You should be happy. You should be happy warriors because that's the fun of it. You know, you're the 300 at Thermopylae. Traditional values of the family, constitutionally limited government, fiscal responsibility, the free market, and yes, a muscular foreign policy is all part of American exceptionalism. It's all part of what has made America great over all of these, these decades and in fact centuries and will continue to make us great. But we have to fight for them. But we've got to fight for it to retain it. And you get to have that fight. This is the one time in your life where you actually get to have these kind of first principled philosophical arguments. No holds barred. Our job is to fight the hydra-headed uh, octopus of the left that has wrapped every tentacle around every aspect of our life, unwrap those tentacles and earn our freedom back. Because again, freedom is a zero-sum game. It is not uh, a shame to come out of the closet and call yourself uh, a conservative on campus. It is an act of courage and bravery uh, to come out and state your beliefs. But it is also an act that is completely um, in keeping with the American tradition of celebrating freedom of speech and freedom of association in this country. Look, I know you guys are facing an uphill battle. You're out there on college campuses. The huge majority of the kids and the vast majority of the professors and faculty, they're all out there on the left. But you guys need to know, first of all, you're not alone. Secondly, you're right. Because you're on the side of the Founding Fathers. How could you possibly be wrong? What you guys need to do is empower yourself so that you know you're not alone. It's always going to fall to people like you for the rest of your life to have arguments with them. Because if you don't have an argument with them, they win. Our message is the better message. And that's why upcoming generations of Americans are going to need to take it upon themselves to do the hard work of freedom, the hard work of saving this Constitution and this republic. Take a stand for freedom. Get involved in the conservative movement today. Visit yaf.org.